How exactly do I chunk my data? That's the first question that comes to mind when you're building a rack system. Unfortunately, irrespective of how you go about it, you're going to run into issues. You're going to lose either global or local context. That's why today we're going to be talking about contextualized chunk embeddings. Now, before understanding this, let's look at a standard rack system. So you have your document, you divide it into smaller chunks, and normally feed those through a dense embedding model. Sometimes people also add full text search, and then they do retrieval on top of that. The problem is that every chunk that you create lives in isolation, and it doesn't have any context of its surrounding chunks or the global document. So there are a number of different approaches in order to add context. One of the most famous one is contextualized retrieval pre-processing. This is an approach proposed by Anthropic late last year. And the idea is very simple. You take a chunk, you feed that chunk along with the whole document or surrounding chunks to an LLM, and you ask the LLM to create context around it. And then you add that context to the chunk. The rest of the embedding process and full text search index is exactly the same. And at retrieval time, you just retrieve those contextualized chunks. Now, the problem is for every chunk, you're going to be sending the chunk plus the document or the surrounding context to an LLM. So for the larger documents, this is going to be extremely expensive because of the LLM calls that you're going to be making. So it's not really feasible. Now, another approach is to do the same thing at embedding level, because embeddings are usually a lot cheaper. One such approach is late chunking. The idea is that you use an embedding model that has long context. So now we have embedding models up to 8,000, or even in some cases, 32,000 tokens. So you take your whole long document, you feed it to an embedding model. The embedding model is going to generate token level embedding, which is different than a document level embedding in dense embedding models. But then you combine those tokens together to create text chunks and also do a pooling operation on the token level embeddings that will give you chunk level embeddings. Now, this approach in theory can preserve both the local and global context because the embedding actually happen at the document level. And since the chunking happens at the end of the process, that's why they named it late chunking. Okay, so where does this contextualized chunking comes into play? Now, we're going to look at that, but first let's understand how exactly the similarity computation works and what are the drawbacks of different approaches. So the first one is no interaction. This happens in most of the cases if you're doing a dense embedding based retrieval. In this case, you take a document or a chunk, you compute embeddings independently. You take user query, compute embeddings, and then whatever the embedding vectors are, you just compute some sort of similarity matrix. Usually people compute cosine similarity. The embedding model hasn't seen the document and the query together. So essentially, you are looking at absolutely no interaction and just trying to find out the similarity based on the final vector that you get. Normally, this results in bad retrieval. Now, another approach is to do full interaction. In this case, what you do is you have your chunks and your query fed into the same model simultaneously. And you say how close this query is to this document. This is full interaction which is usually a lot more accurate. And it's a basis of something called cross encoder. However, this is very compute intensive and people usually don't do this on the corpus level. That's why it's usually used as a secondary step in a re-ranker, which is a lot more accurate and is going to give you much more finer grained results compared to a bi encoder that you use for the initial retrieval. Now, there is something in between. This is called late interaction. The idea here is that when you compute embeddings for the document and for the query independently, rather than getting a fixed size vector that you usually get as a result of a dense embedding vector, 
you compute embeddings at token level, very similar to what I was showing you in the case of late chunking. And then you compute similarity at the token level rather than a whole vector level. Usually people use BERT models for the initial token level embeddings and then some sort of similarity metrics at retrieval time. Colbert is a perfect example of this. Now, this means that depending on how many tokens are in your document plus your query, you are going to get a multi-vector representation instead of a single vector representation that you get as a result of a dense model. And in practice, this usually results in much better retrieval because you have much more fine-grained embedding models now. But this also means you're going to need a lot more storage plus a lot more compute in order to compute these multi-vector representations. Okay, so I hope this gives you a very good idea of different mechanisms that you can use for retrieval. This brings us back to contextualized chunk embeddings. I'm going to show you a code implementation that you can run on your own data, but let's try to understand what exactly this is. Now, in contextualized chunk embeddings, you take your whole document, you compute chunks based on whatever chunking strategy that you want to use. And in the next step, you pass this through a contextualized chunk embedding model. In this case, the embedding model is looking at every chunk along with the original document from where these chunks are coming from. And it's going to be adding a lot of global and local context through each chunk embedding. So here is how it looks like at query time. You have your user query, you do a chunk level retrieval, so you get a chunk, but with every chunk, you have the associated contextual information, both on local level as well as on global level. So you can actually look at which document this chunk is coming from, along with what are the most related chunks in that specific document. Now, how is this different from late interaction or late chunking? In late chunking, we compute embeddings on document level, and then we create vectors based on chunk levels. In this case, we initially divide each document into chunks and then compute embeddings while preserving the global information. A quick word from our sponsor today, Emergent. It's a new web coding platform that turns plain English text prompts into working full stack web apps. Type what you want and Emergent generates the front end and back end together. If you need Google sign in, Google authentication is just one click ad. If you want AI features and don't want to worry about the API keys, Emergent has its own internal API keys. Here is a quick YouTube style clone and a text to image app from a single prompt. Emergent pulls all the relevant API endpoints, builds the app and even run integration tests with the AI coding agent so you can ship with confidence. So if you have an idea, Emergent makes it fast to go from prompts to working web apps. Check out Emergent, link is going to be in the video description. Now back to the video. Okay, so here's how the comparison looks like. Now keep in mind, this is based on their marketing material. So take it with a grain of salt. So they're comparing it with something like dense embeddings from OpenAI or any other embeddings, which have no context preservation. Then you have metadata augmentation, you add summaries or contextual retrieval, which have partial contextual information. Now, in case of the contextualized chunk embeddings, you're not using an LLM, you're using an embedding model, which is usually a lot cheaper, but because of the nature of how this uh, embedding model is trained, you are going to preserve a lot more context. Uh, and usually, uh, since you get a fixed sized embedding model at the output, the complexity of integration is going to be very similar to just replacing it with a a dense embedding model, right? And according to them, this gets you the highest retrieval accuracy. We're going to look at a code example later in the video, but I'm going to show you just some quick benchmarks. So they did some benchmarks on different types of data sets. Now, Voyage is a very good company. I think now it's part of MongoDB, but they have been training some very interesting embedding models. It's not open source, you have to pay similar to OpenAI, 
but their embedding models are being used by companies like Harvey and some code specific models as well. So you can see that they have been benchmarking the embedding models on different niches and seems to have state of the art accuracy. This is on chunk level. Here is the same performance on document level. Seems like it's outperforming all the other embedding models on these data sets. Okay, but a very interesting observation when I was looking at some of the data. So if you look at increasing chunk size in terms of number of tokens, a normal dense embedding models will usually have better retrieval accuracy. So they have YH3 large, this is their dense embedding model. You can see the retrieval accuracy increases as you increase the chunk size. But for the YH context 3 model, interestingly, the retrieval accuracy actually drops as you increase the number of tokens in the chunk. So in this case, you want to keep the chunks to smaller size. Now, the only problem is going to be if you keep the chunks too small, again, you're going to run into storage issues. So you'll have to find a balance. But the good thing is that it also supports quantization of these embedding models, right? So here are the accuracies or quality based on different quantization level. You can use binary quantization, which is going to save you a lot of money, 4-bit, and then that's 16-bit, right? So if you look at the quantization, even if you use binary quantization at 2048 vector size, it gives you very close retrieval accuracy to using the full size. I would say there is probably around 2 or 3 percent drop, right? But th this uses dynamic size. So there are multiple different embedding sizes that you can use. Before showing you a code example, let me walk you through the pricing. So this is around 18 cents per million token. The first 200 million tokens are free. As a comparison, here is the Gemini embedding 001. This is their latest multimodal embedding, which is about 15 cents per million token. Okay, so let me walk you through a quick example and then I'll show you a code that you can run on your own machine. So let's say here are eight different chunks. In this case, we're using chunk level or sentence level chunking, right? So you can see that these talks about different quarterly earnings for different companies. Now let's say our prompt is, what was the revenue growth for Leafy Inc. in Q2 2024? So if you look here, the first chunk is, this is the SEC filing on Leafy Inc. Q2 2024. The second chunk says the company's revenue increased by 15% compared to the previous quarters, right? Now, in the same document, you can see a very similar situation. The first chunk talks about a company. The second chunk talks about a revenue increase or decrease for the same year. But the second chunk does not have the company information, neither which quarter or year it's talking about. So if you were to do re-ranking based on YH3 large, since the question is talking about Leafy Inc., the normal dense embedding model basically picks this as the first chunk. Now, it does have information about Q2 2024, but it doesn't have any information about the actual revenue of the company. The second chunk, which is actually ranked eighth in this case, does not specifically mention the company by name. When you use the context three embeddings, since it preserves both the global and local context, so it knows which company this specific chunk is talking about. Now, this is an example from their documentation. So I'm going to walk you through a real example of my own testing. So let's have a look at the notebook now. Okay, so here's the documentation where they talk about contextualized chunk embeddings. Okay, but you need to sign up and initially also connect your credit card in order to use the embedding models. But the first 200 million tokens are free. And I think you need to add only $5 to your account. Okay, so here's how the structure of your documents is going to look like. You are going to divide your document into smaller chunks and then just pass on a list of lists with the chunk IDs. Okay, so this Google Collab Notebook is going to be available. The first thing I did here was create a custom class for chunking my documents. I am doing sentence level chunking. Depending on the structure of your document, do it either on paragraph level 
or maybe section by section. So then we take every document that is going to be coming in, we create chunks, which is basically isolating each sentence. And then we are going to create this object where I'm keeping track of the document title and essentially some other metadata, including what was the location of every chunk or every sentence in the document. So at the end of the day, when we do the chunking, we create a list of lists that is going to contain all the chunks. I am using 1024, probably an overkill in this case, since the document size is going to be much lower. So play around with this parameter, but we just provide our input documents. Now, in the other case, I'm also computing the standard embeddings, and I just wanted to see what type of results I would get when I use the standard dense embedding versus the contextualized embeddings. And at runtime, we do search on both of those. Now, let me show you the actual documents that are going into the into the embedding model. So here is a document about AWS S3 technical documentation. It specifically talks about AWS, what are the storage classes, what type of encryption we use, what are the different access controls. Then here is another document that I created. It talks about similar setup for Azure. And then there is a compliance requirement document for FinTech, right? So three different documents, two of these have very similar information. And here are some of my queries. What encryption does AWS use for SSE, KMS? In this case, the actual information appears without AWS, right? So what I did was I ran the same, I think five, six queries through both of the embedding models and just did retrieval on top of both of those. Okay, so I'm not going to bore you a lot with the internal mechanism, but for each one of them, I am retrieving the top three documents. For example, what encryption does AWS use for SSE KMS? So you can see that both of them actually identified the correct chunk in this case. Now, the second chunk is also coming from AWS. Yeah, I think both of these models does a pretty good job at retrieving the relevant chunk at the top of the retrieve documents. Same is the case for the other part as well. It does return the correct information in terms of the retrieve document. Now, the third one is what are the storage costs for archive tier? So in this case, the contextualized chunk embedding actually retrieved the most relevant chunk at the top. And the standard embedding model, I think, doesn't even retrieve that specific chunk at all. Now, here's another one. What is the data retention policy for audit logs? Now, the first two chunks are relevant. The second chunks are also relevant. In case of the contextualized chunk embedding, it actually returned a chunk that was, or a sentence that is part of the same paragraph. But the standard embedding model actually retrieved the third chunk, which is not part of the data retention policy. For example, if you look here, this talks about the platform must maintain delete detailed records of all data processing activities, including purpose, categories, retention, etc. But if you look at that specific section, it only talks about those three sentences that were returned by the contextualized chunk embeddings. And we see very similar issues with the customer identification program policies as well. In this case, even the second and third chunk that is coming from the standard chunk embeddings is actually irrelevant. So here's the actual part which talks about customer identification program. So this was a quick overview of contextualized chunk embeddings. Do check it out. I think it's a good tool to have in your tool set. But keep in mind, whenever you are designing rack systems, the choices really depends on how your data looks like and what exactly the retrieval setup is supposed to look like. So there is no one fit all solution when it comes to the traditional retrieval augmented generation systems. But it's always good to know these new techniques because they can come in very handy. Anyways, do let me know what you think, how your experience with this new method is, and also put your questions in the comment section below. I'm going to try my best to respond to them. Anyways, I hope you found this video useful. Thanks for watching, and as always, see you in the next one.